Okay, so when biologists talk about altruism, biological altruism, what they mean is behavior that we see in the natural world where an animal seems to be hurting its own chances of reproducing and in such a way as to confer a benefit on another animal so that the other animal seems to have its chances of reproducing increased uh, because of the cost being paid by this, by this altruist. Uh, so perhaps the best known examples are ants. Ants, fantastically social creatures. Now in the, the most complex social species, so-called uh, eusocial species, Really, you know, there's the queens and there's the workers. And the entire lives of the workers, their entire developmental process, all of their behavior, is really dedicated to raising the larvae of the queen. So they're not raising their own offspring at all. They're helping to raise another organism's offspring, the queen's offspring. And this in ants is taken to spectacular extremes. You know, there's some ants that the workers become you know, living honeypots, basically, where all they do is, is hang upside down inside the nest from the ceiling and store a huge amount of liquid food in their, in their bodies for the larvae to feed off. Their whole life is just spent as a kind of living food store. Um, incredible self-sacrifice, it would appear, by those ants. There's other species where you know, the ants live in a nest, and at the end of the day, you know, when, it comes, when nightfall comes, there's a risk of predators attacking the nest overnight. So these ants seal the nest from the outside, and they're stuck outside. They can't get back in, and they die in the night because it's so cold. But the rest of the colony get inside the nest gets to survive. So those ants have stayed out in the cold, sacrificed their lives, it would seem, so that the rest of the colony can survive. Now these examples, they're biologically altruistic. That doesn't necessarily mean that there's anything psychological going on. Right? It doesn't mean that the, the ant is genuinely motivated by concern for the other ants. Um, all we're saying when we say it's biologically altruistic is that the behavior you know, really hurts the chances of reproduction of, of one ant and confers a real material benefit to the chances of reproduction for another. And this kind of biological altruism uh, we see all over the natural world. You know, we even see it among single-celled microorganisms. And I think one of my absolute favorite examples of biological altruism is in amoebas. It's in an amoeba called Dictyostelium discoidium, where you know, for most of their life cycle, these, these amoebas, they're just like what we think of amoebas as being. They're just single-celled organisms living in the soil. But when food gets scarce, what they do is they detect how many other amoebas there are around them in their environment. And if they detect there's a lot of other amoebas close to them, they aggregate into a single slug-like thing, often called a grex or a pseudoplasmodium, a kind of mobile slug and then they move as one in the direction of heat and light. It really looks like a slug, you know. It really looks like these amoebas have got together, tens of thousands of them, and they formed a multicellular organism. It's incredible. But then when they actually get to a, a suitable place, they do something even more amazing, which is that they form a fruiting body, where about a fifth of the amoebas basically sacrifice their lives uh, to form a hard stalk. So 20% of them die, they form this hard stalk, so that the other 80% can climb up the stalk and gather at the top and produce spores. And those spores drift through the air and they land somewhere where hopefully there's a bit more heat and light and food than, than where these, these amoebas found themselves. So if you think of those, those poor amoebas in the stalk, you know, they are being just as altruistic as those ants. They're sacrificing their lives so that other amoebas can reproduce. Leading to the question, what is going on here? How does this sort of behavior evolve? Is this sort of behavior compatible with Darwinian 
evolution by natural selection or not? Because you might intuitively think, well, evolution by natural selection is this fiercely competitive process, this struggle for existence, you know, this battle for survival, to use Spencer's phrase, survival of the fittest, you know, where each animal is, is out for itself, animals are just trying to survive and reproduce at the expense of others. And yet here we see in amoebas and ants and all over the place, animals helping other animals. What's going on? How can this be reconciled with Darwinian logic? Now, I think the answer to this question, basically, uh, it was discovered by a scientist called Bill Hamilton in the 60s. He was a graduate student, graduate student based in London, based at UCL's Galton Laboratory and, and also at LSE. Um, just had, in the early 60s, this incredibly seminal idea, drawing inspiration from two main sources. The first is R.A. Fisher. Fisher, really one of the architects of evolutionary biology as we know it. Uh, really a great genius who founded the field of population genetics. In one of his books, The Genetical Theory of Natural Selection, Fisher just made this kind of throwaway remark, all right, that isn't it kind of weird that insects are really distasteful to predators uh, in some species? Because the insect doesn't really gain anything by being distasteful, because it's dead. By the time it's in the predator's mouth and the predator's bitten into it and eaten it, it doesn't really gain anything by being distasteful. But Fisher says, oh, well, you know, it doesn't benefit itself, but it benefits the siblings. Benefits its siblings because that predator will be less likely to eat the siblings of this insect that's just eaten and found really unpleasant. And Fisher says, well, of course, you know, uh, there's an evolutionary incentive there, although it's only half as great, he says, as if the insect had itself survived. The other key influence on Hamilton was, was J.B.S. Haldane, another key architect of what we call the, the modern synthesis, you know, modern evolutionary biology as we know it. Haldane, you know, there's a story about Haldane that may or may not be true, but I think is probably true, that he was in a pub one day, short distance from here, uh, near UCL, called the Orange Tree, drinking with his graduate students, one of whom was uh, John Maynard Smith himself went on to become a great evolutionary biologist. And someone asked him, you know, what would, what would it take in evolutionary terms to give you an incentive to jump into a river to save a drowning stranger? And the story is that Haldane sat and calculated on the back of an envelope for a few minutes and came up with this quip that, well, I'd jump into the river to save two brothers or eight cousins. And the thought here is that you know, even under a, a ruthless Darwinian process of natural selection, actually organisms have an incentive to help one another sometimes. They have an incentive to help their genetic relatives. And the incentive to help is proportional in some sense to the closeness of the genetic relationship. So your evolutionary incentive to help your brothers and sisters is greater than your evolutionary incentive to help your cousins. Um, what Hamilton did was, uh, pretty much independently of, of Haldane, um, really took this insight, originally from Fisher, and developed it into a rigorous theory, a really powerful uh, uh, mathematical theory that's now usually called inclusive fitness theory, where what Hamilton did was show that the the, the basic insight there of Fisher and Haldane can actually be captured in a surprisingly simple mathematical result. This is a result that's now come to be known as Hamilton's rule. Right? And the rule says that an altruistic behavior is actually favored by natural selection when a particular condition is satisfied. The condition RB is greater than C. Where, uh, to just explain those terms, C is the magnitude of the cost paid by the altruist, measured in terms of how much reproduction it sacrifices. Uh, B is the benefit, the benefit that gets conferred on the queen or on another organism uh, by that behavior, again measured in units of, of reproductive success. And then R 
is what's called the coefficient of relatedness, a measure of how closely these organisms uh, resemble each other genetically relative to two randomly picked organisms from the population. Now, a lot of debate has ensued in the past 50 years you know, about whether, whether Hamilton was, was right or not, whether this rule is right or not. Uh, a large part of my book, The Philosophy of Social Evolution, is really about this debate and about the controversy that has raged about Hamilton's ideas. A lot of people look at this RB greater than C rule and think, you know, how can it possibly be so simple? You know, how can the mathematics of altruism just boil down to this incredibly simple calculation, just this cost-benefit calculation? Is RB greater than C or not? They think it's too simple. I mean, in fact, I think this rule is, is basically correct, but subject to a few qualifications, subject to a few caveats. I mean, first of all, it's important to realize that relatedness much, must actually be understood very broadly for this rule to be correct. It's not actually just about your family relations. It's not just about your kin in the ordinary sense. It's really about genetic resemblance, genetic similarity. To what extent do you resemble this potential beneficiary genetically or not? And sometimes you can get this genetic resemblance arising without, um, without any kinship in the ordinary sense. Richard Dawkins has a, has a nice story in his book, The Selfish Gene, about what he calls a green beard gene, where the green beard gene has three effects. You know, it causes the organism with the gene to grow a green beard. And it then causes that organism to go and seek out other individuals in the population who also have green beards. And then it causes the individual to behave altruistically to those individuals with the green beards. Uh, so it's causing this altruism. The altruism is not necessarily directed towards uh, close relatives. It's directed towards other organisms with green beards. But Dawkins argues that's still enough. Such a gene can spread by natural selection. And the reason it can spread is that the benefits of the altruism produced by the green beard gene are tending to fall on other organisms with that same gene, other organisms with the green beard. And that's actually the way we should think about relatedness, you know, not as requiring kinship in the intuitive sense, but just requiring that at relevant points in the genome, organisms share the same genes. I mean, the other qualifications, you know, this RB greater than C rule, really what it's giving us is a snapshot, a snapshot of a really complex evolutionary process, you know. Um, the fact that it's satisfied at one moment doesn't necessarily guarantee that it will be satisfied the next moment. And also, I think you should think of this not as providing the complete story, a full, complete explanation of why altruism exists in the natural world, but rather a kind of organizing framework, a framework in which we can then mount further investigations of the sort of actual ecological processes that can create positive R, or that can create positive B, or that can help offset the cost to the altruist. So really, it's a starting point for further investigation of the, of the real natural phenomena, rather than this kind of grand explanation that just explains everything. Nevertheless, I think Hamilton basically gave us the answer. He explained how altruistic behavior can be reconciled with Darwinian logic.